So far, we've been looking at the rules for groups and the properties that follow from those rules. Today, we look at a property that isn't on the list, commutativity. This property plays an unexpected role in quantum physics and in the theory of Lie groups. We will just briefly hint at these intriguing applications here, leaving the details for later. What we also want to find out is, when a group operation fails to commute, can we somehow fix it? Or can we at least come up with something that is almost as good as commutativity? Commutativity is really simple. It just means that you can operate on group elements in any order you like. You know, a plus b equals b plus a. When a binary operation is commutative, it doesn't care which input comes first and which comes second. This makes life much easier. You just throw some elements together and you always get the same result. When the operation of a group commutes, its Cayley table is symmetric along the main diagonal. That's because when you swap the order of the two inputs, you swap their row and column index in the table. Groups with a commutative operation are often called abelian. Some groups are abelian, others are not. In most number systems, addition and multiplication commute, but subtraction and division don't. For the symmetries of the square, the rotations commute, but the group as a whole doesn't. When you combine two reflections in different orders, you may get different results. This example shows that a non-abelian group can have an abelian subgroup. We already talked about cyclic groups before. I mentioned that a cyclic group, by definition, can be generated from a single element. The rotations of a regular polygon are a great example. The only generator you need is the rotation by the smallest non-zero angle. You just repeat that rotation a number of times to reach all the other angles. All these angles are integer multiples of the smallest one. And if you want to compose two rotations, you just add the angles. This works for any cyclic group. You just count how many times you perform the generator. So each element is a kind of integer multiple of the generator. For a finite group, it only takes a finite number of steps to reach the identity element. At that moment, you have basically come all the way around and the cycle repeats. Our count falls back to zero before we continue counting. I hope this reminds you of addition modulo n. Whenever you take more than n steps, you come back to zero. This is why any cyclic group with n elements is always isomorphic to the integers with addition modulo n. And since addition is commutative, so are the resulting rotations. The isomorphism means that both groups are basically the same. So if one is abelian, so is the other. That's one of the advantages of isomorphisms. They allow you to transfer knowledge about one group to another. Cyclic groups basically copy commutativity from the addition of the integers. As a consequence, cyclic groups are always abelian. Okay, this part of the video is going to be interesting, but also challenging. I want to convey some deep and intriguing ideas. Unfortunately, at this point on our journey, we don't have nearly enough mathematical baggage yet. I won't be able to explain this stuff in a sufficiently clear and precise way. You'll have to forgive me if it stays a little vague and abstract. I hope to cover many of these topics in much more detail in future videos because, honestly, they are really intriguing. First things first. Rotations, reflections and other geometric transformations can often be represented as matrices. For example, two-dimensional vectors can be rotated using linear transformations. So the rotational symmetries of the square can be written as two by two matrices. To perform two symmetries in a row, you just multiply their matrices. One key feature of matrix multiplication is that it doesn't commute. If you multiply by a rotation matrix and then a reflection matrix, 
you may get a different answer than if you multiply in the other order. This is just the same kind of non-commutativity we saw in the Cayley table earlier, but now expressed in terms of matrices. This simple observation happens to play a huge role in quantum physics, where we use matrices not just to transform things, but also to measure things. The fact that they don't commute implies that the order of your measurements can make a difference. If you first measure the position of your particle with a matrix called X, and then you measure the momentum with a matrix called P, you will get a specific result. But if you measure P first and then X, you will get a different result. Every measurement always influences the result of the next measurement in a fundamental way. And when you reverse the order of the measurements, you also change the way they influence each other. In physics, this is written with an expression of the form px minus xp. If x and p were ordinary numbers, this expression would always be equal to zero, because xp and px have the same value. But when p and x don't commute, the expression is different from zero. Such an expression is called a commutator. It's typically written with square brackets. Don't let this notation confuse you. The commutator is just a good old binary operation that takes two inputs, x and p. It tells us not only whether x and p commute or not, but also exactly by how much they fail to commute. These kinds of commutators are central to the mathematical treatment of quantum physics. When the commutator is non-zero, it tells us that the two measurements don't commute, which means that the order of measurement is important. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle can also be expressed in terms of commutators. Since x and p don't commute, you can never know both the position and the momentum of a particle at the same time. I'm obviously skipping over many details here. For starters, measurements are not really done by traditional matrices, they are done by operators, which you can think of as matrices with infinitely many entries. Also, you probably noticed that this definition of a commutator uses two operations, multiplication and subtraction. So I'm using a definition that technically cannot be defined using only the rules of group theory, where we only have a single binary operation available. There are more details that I'm intentionally skipping over here. The goal is just to give you a first impression. If all goes well, we will talk about quantum physics and other details a lot more in future videos. Here's another important application of matrix commutators, this time in the context of Lie groups. In the video about Euler's formula, I already mentioned that the unit circle is an example of a Lie group. A Lie group is a continuous group, where the elements are infinitely close to each other. Each element in this group is a point on the circle, which you can think of as a complex number with a modulus of 1. But you can also think of it as a 2 by 2 rotation matrix. It may be weird to think of points on a circle as matrices, but remember that complex numbers are active. They transform the complex plane by stretching and rotating it. So each point on the plane is not just a passive number, but also an active linear transformation, which you can easily represent as a matrix. Again, don't worry if this is a bit vague. We will spend more time fleshing out the details later. Right now, all you need to know is that complex numbers on the unit circle can be seen as 2x2 two two rotation matrices. Since complex multiplication is commutative, the multiplication of our 2x2 two two rotation matrices is also commutative. So, even though matrix multiplication does not commute in general, here we have a subset of matrices where it does. Or, in other words, the large group of all 2x2 two two matrices is not abelian, but these 2x2 two two rotation matrices are a smaller subgroup that is abelian. This is the continuous analog of what we saw for the symmetries of the square, where the rotations were also an abelian subgroup of a non-abelian larger one. Now, remember Euler's formula? It allows us to map from a purely imaginary number i times theta to a point on the unit circle. In the context of Lie groups, it will make sense to move the imaginary axis to the right, so that it becomes the tangent line at the number 1. 
and in this context the number 1 is really the 2 by 2 identity matrix. One of the main goals of Lie theory will be to study the circle by studying this particular tangent line instead. This will make things a lot easier, because, crucially, we can use addition on this tangent line. The exponential function then helps us by turning this addition into a multiplication. When you add two angles, you multiply the corresponding complex numbers on the unit circle. The exponential function automatically helps us by converting from the easy world of addition on a straight line to the more difficult world of multiplication on a curved shape. This works beautifully, but that's because we actually got lucky in a way. We are lucky because in this specific example, addition and multiplication are both commutative. This makes it pretty easy to transfer from the additive group of purely imaginary numbers to the multiplicative group of unit complex numbers. But we won't always be so lucky. Imagine, if you can, a higher dimensional group of n by n matrices. This sphere is the analog of the unit circle earlier. This is obviously just a very informal picture. In reality we will be talking about much higher dimensional shapes that I can't even draw on a two-dimensional screen. So you'll have to use your imagination. The sphere represents a complicated high-dimensional shape. Each point on this shape is an element of our group. And since we're talking specifically about a group of matrices, each point is an n by n matrix. Again, I realize that it may be weird to picture points on a shape as matrices. It may help to imagine what happens when we smoothly change one of the entries in such a matrix. As we do so, the matrix itself smoothly transforms into a new one. Visually, the corresponding point starts moving across the higher dimensional shape. One of the points on the shape is the identity matrix. Every group must have a neutral element, so the identity matrix will always be some specific point on the shape. Next, we draw the tangent plane at that point, with its origin at the tangent point. Just like the vertical tangent line to the unit circle, this tangent space contains objects that we can add. After all, the tangent space is always going to be a linear vector space, with vector addition. And once again, crucially, vector addition is always commutative. But then we want to map from this nice and easy tangent space to the more complicated curved shape. And that's where things start to go wrong. Because in general, matrix multiplication is not commutative. We are forced to map a commutative addition to a non-commutative multiplication. And that's where most of the complexity of Lie algebras comes from. In order to fix this problem, we will need to use commutators. They swoop in to save the day because they perfectly capture the non-commutativity of matrix multiplication. The algebra of the commutators and how they interact with each other is sufficient to tell us exactly how to map from addition to multiplication. The Lie algebra of the commutators, together with the linear algebra of the tangent vectors, turns out to be all the information we need. This will allow us to reduce the study of complicated curved shapes to the study of commutator algebras, which is a lot simpler. This is why the study of Lie algebras is full of commutators, as we will see later. Okay, wow, that was a fast and high-level overview of some of the applications of commutators. We don't have all the necessary mathematical background yet, so again, don't worry if this part of the video made little sense to you. The only reason I wanted to share these abstract ideas here is because they hint at the central role that commutativity plays in higher math and physics. And you have to admit that the connections between commutativity, quantum physics and Lie groups are exciting. We will run into commutators a lot more in the future. Let's say that we have a non-abelian group. Is there anything we can do to make it abelian? Or at least, if we can't get commutativity, what is the next best thing? Let's pick apart a concrete example. We will look at the symmetries of the square again. Here is a little diagram that tells us that we can either first rotate 90 degrees and then 180, or first 180 degrees and then 90. 
the result is the same, so the two rotations commute. Mathematicians sometimes even say that this little diagram commutes. There are two different paths you can follow, and they both end up at the same place. Here we have a diagram that doesn't commute. We combine a 90 degree counterclockwise rotation with a vertical flip. If we rotate first and then flip, we get one result. If we flip first and then rotate, we get a different result. You could try this with a square piece of paper to convince yourself that the two results really are different. So the vertical flip and the 90 degree rotation do not commute. You can see this in the diagram because the two paths do not end up in the same place. What we want to do now is fix the diagram. Specifically, we want to replace this vertical flip with something else so that the diagram closes up again. This is actually quite easy. We're dealing with a group, so each arrow has an inverse. All we have to do is invert this arrow at the bottom. We turn it into its inverse rotation, 90 degrees clockwise. This tells us that what we need on the left must be R1 followed by V, followed by the inverse of R1. You can evaluate this expression yourself by doing some lookups in the Cayley table or by making a paper square and transforming it explicitly. You will find that the result is H, the flip around the horizontal axis. So by putting H here on the left, the diagram commutes again. Please note that our group is still not commutative. The only thing we have fixed is this one little diagram. And the diagram involves three different symmetries now. If we want to swap the order of the rotation and the vertical flip, we have to replace the vertical flip with a horizontal one. This is very different from the first diagram, where we only had two symmetries, and we could simply swap their order. In a diagram like this one, the vertical and horizontal flip are called conjugates of each other. One element is a conjugate of the other if you can write it in this form. You sandwich one of the conjugates between an element and its inverse. The result is the other conjugate. See if you can spot the sandwich in the diagram. We apply a rotation, then we flip, and finally we rotate back using the inverse of the first rotation. The sandwich always has to consist of an element and its inverse. That's the only way to make the diagram close up nicely. You can also easily turn things around. Flip the top and bottom arrows and read the diagram from right to left. You see that this time, V is the one that can be written in the same form, this time with H in the sandwich. Algebraically, you can derive this by just multiplying both sides of the equation with a second sandwich, which cancels the first sandwich on one side. That's one of the weirdest sentences I've ever said. Out loud, at least. This shows that conjugacy goes both ways. H is a conjugate of V, and V is a conjugate of H. The conjugacy relation is symmetric. Let's see what this all looks like on an actual square shape. We're going to flip over its vertical axis, but I also want to mark the horizontal axis. Now, instead of doing our vertical flip straight away, let's put it inside a sandwich. We rotate 90 degrees first. The key thing is that this turns vertical into horizontal and vice versa. So, when we do our vertical flip next, we actually flip over what used to be the horizontal axis. Finally, we rotate back by 90 degrees. This is what the net result looks like. And, as we expected, it's as if we had done a horizontal flip. So, we can use conjugates to fix little diagrams to make them commute again. But the real importance of conjugates is that they allow us to see things from different perspectives. It may not look like it at first glance, but this diagram represents a temporary change of perspective. We start at the top left in our initial perspective. Then we rotate the square 
to move over to the new perspective. We do our original operation, the vertical flip, in the new perspective. And then finally, we rotate back to our original perspective. This is why it's so important that the two pieces of the sandwich are each other's inverses. We have to make sure that we can get back to our original perspective at the end. So we have to undo the first perspective change. H and V are conjugates, with a 90 degree rotation taking us there and back again. The best way to put this in words is that the vertical flip looks like a horizontal one from the perspective of a 90 degree rotation. That makes total sense because the entire point of such a rotation is that it changes vertical into horizontal. Later, when we talk about linear transformations and matrices, we will see that a change in perspective is actually a change in basis. Each matrix transforms a set of vectors and we can make that transformation simpler by doing it in a different basis. In this example, we rotate to a new basis where the transformation now just becomes a simple horizontal stretch. Then we rotate back, and we find that in our original basis, the transformation looks like a rotated stretch. Conjugate matrices are usually called similar matrices. Two matrices are similar to each other when they are really the same transformation, expressed in two different bases. By changing from one basis to another, we get a fresh perspective on the transformation, which often makes it easier for us to analyze its effects. Now that we have this particular example under control, let's look at all the other symmetries of the square. I already mentioned that conjugacy is symmetric, so when h is conjugate to v, v is also conjugate to h. When we connect each symmetry to all its conjugates, the set falls apart into smaller subsets. H and V are in a subset together. So are R1 and R3. But note that R2 is in a set by itself. It isn't conjugate to anything else. The neutral element is also always by itself. These little subsets are called the conjugacy classes of the group. When two elements are in the same conjugacy class, they are very similar to each other. The rotations over 90 and 270 degrees are similar, because they can both be used as generators for the other rotations. R2, the rotation over 180 degrees, cannot. It can only generate two of the four rotations of the square. Somehow, the conjugacy relation manages to capture these distinctions. It also captures the difference between two different kinds of reflections. H and V are similar to each other because they both reflect over an axis that runs through opposite edges of the square. The diagonal reflections, on the other hand, have axes that run through opposite corner points instead. This makes both kinds of reflections sufficiently different that they end up in separate classes. Or, to put it in other words, no matter which perspective you choose, you will never be able to see a diagonal flip as a horizontal or vertical one. It's important to point out that these small sets have nothing to do with cosets. Remember from the previous video that cosets emerge from a subgroup and that they all have the same size. Conjugacy classes have different sizes, as you can see, and they don't come from a subgroup at all. A group can have multiple subgroups, each with its own different division into cosets. In contrast, a group can be split into conjugacy classes in only one unique way. For completeness, here are the conjugacy relations between all pairs of symmetries. This is not a Cayley table. Instead of the binary group operation, it gives you the sandwich product between pairs of elements. Yes, that is the official name for this thing, the sandwich product. I didn't make that up. So in this table you can look up the conjugacy relation we were talking about earlier, plus all other conjugacy relations between the symmetries of the square. When a group operation commutes, you can change the order of elements in an expression. So in an abelian group we can swap these two elements, so we can always get the two slices of bread next to each other. They cancel out. 
leaving the element conjugate to itself. This is why conjugation is very boring and trivial for abelian groups. Every element is just in a class all by itself. Conjugacy is only interesting in groups that don't commute. In a way, just like commutators, conjugacy is another device that we can use to measure how non-commutative a group is. I hope you enjoyed this video, in spite of the abstract bits. If you did, please consider supporting all angles financially by becoming a patron. Just click the Patreon link in the description below. Your contribution makes a huge difference. As always, you can also support us by liking and sharing this video, and by posting your insightful comments below. I typically try to read all comments, so feel free to share your thoughts or ask questions. Thank you, and see you next time.